Okay, so can you guys hear me? Yeah. Awesome. So my name is James, I, or Substack, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, software and why most of the time it is just way too big and out of control. So uh, software is, is really like, like doing it well. It's all about controlling complexity. And so this is uh, Brian Kernigan, one of, the, one of the early people behind Unix and, and uh, working at Bell Labs, which was this like, uh, it was this really um, strange situation where all of these people from um, just the, like the, the genesis of computing were all concentrated into this one little area and they, they had this like design epiphany about how to build applications really well that are very long lasting and that compose together very well. So um, we have, <laughs> we, we have a, a phrase in English um, like Unix philosophy you, you hear a lot. It's, it's, this, um, it's this ethos, this aesthetic that you know, tiny things are much better than big things, and like just pieces should just do one thing well. And so, like you, you see this in the command line, right? If you know, you, you have uh, applications, and you can just pipe them together. Like you, you have um, like you know, you you cat out some things, and then you pipe that to grep, and you pipe that to to. Uh, I don't know, T or said, and then you like dump that to a file, and you have this chain of, of events, and each of the pieces is very small. But like together, it's this, uh, it, it performs this complicated action, but without like having to just find exactly the right application that does everything that you need in exactly the way that you need. Like with these little pieces, you can achieve a lot more than you would through other means. And so, it's like when you have these these sprawling applications um, that that really are very uh, tightly coupled to to each other, you have a lot of um, a, a problems with with maintaining that long term and like just working on them. It's it's not fun, right? Because <laughs> because you know you have to sort of um, come up get up to speed with with like every weird idiosyncrasy in, in this gigantic code base and, and like how new code needs to fit in there to, to not break everything ever. And you have to spend a lot of time maintaining code instead of um, like experimenting and writing new stuff. And so that's why I'm a really big proponent of um, you know, m more like a, a school of fish instead of a giant whale. Um, just these little tiny pieces that do thing well, that, that do very, well-defined, focused things very well. Um, now, there, there are two main ways to do this, I think, in, in, in Node, at least, and in browser-side JavaScript, too, which I'll, I'll show you in a bit. Um, you can either use a modular system, that's the like using require and publishing packages to the Node package repository, NPM. And then you can also um, break things up uh, pretty much exactly like you do in Unix, where you have separate processes and they talk to each other mostly over the network and 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 that's not just it's not just um specific to unix this is this is something that you can do in any platform it's just that sort of that that ethos has w was born in in the bell labs and unix and and it, it's very strong tradition in like doing app development that way so the first thing um, I can show you, I, I know yesterday um, somebody presented on CJS, which is uh, like um, AMD style require stuff. Um, I have a project called Browserify that lets you just take node modules directly and just use them in your browser code. So you can use the same kind of require. Um, and here is that, ex where is that, there it is, okay. Bigger, okay. So, um, so say I have a node program. Um, this is a, a simple program here that just uses a module I wrote, actually, called Falafel, but you know anybody can write these things. Um, and it, it performs a source transformation. You know, um, this, is, this is mostly just an algorithmic thing, so it's just like taking JavaScript source and parsing it, and, and it gives you a nice little callback API right here you can use to transform the source. So 
for this source here, we just um, add a little function wrapper around all of the call expressions, which should be uh, this call to math.pow right here, and this call to console.log right here. So when we run this, yeah, so here we have this uh, FFF thing, and here's the other FFF. Those were inserted by our program, and that's a node program. I ran it, it uses require. Uh, it's pulling in modules from the node modules directory, and, and this, is, this is really cool because, you know, instead of, instead of uh, using, say, a, a Spreema.js, which is the parser I'm using directly, we can, like, have a nice higher level abstraction, and it's, it's pretty short, which is good. Um, now, if you want to start writing applications this way with lots of modules in the browser, it's very difficult because, I mean, first of all, you have to find modules, um, and they're all written in kind of a different style, and you, they, they usually have their own way of, of uh, of letting you put the script tags into your page, and it's really complicated. Um, what I really love about Node is we have this package manager, npm, and you can just do npm install, like falafel, to get that module. Now, most of these modules are written just for Node, but, um, but Node is, is kind of, like it's, it's very consistent, which is nice, and it's not something that you get in the browser. And, and, it, and you can, so, my project Browserify here, if you just type Browserify, and you take that, that node program, transform.js, and then um, we can just uh, write that to a, a file called bundle.js. Oh, whoops, I'm using the old one. Anyways, so it, it just generates all of this stuff that shims out how node works, um, but for the browser. So if we actually just run this web page, um, it, it can print out for us exactly what it did. So you can actually use modules, and the modules can have subdependencies. Like the module I'm using right now has a subdependency, and and you get exactly the same uh, require resolution as in Node. So you can actually like it gives you a lot of freedom to move pieces around in your application, especially when you have uh, backend components and frontend components. So you can be a lot more fluid with how like where you put particular pieces, um, like a lot of people say things about, you know, using the same code on the browser and the server, but really you probably don't want to be doing that very much. You probably, but, but it's really beneficial to be able to have more control over where you run the code. You don't want to run it like simultaneously so much, but it's really helpful to like be able to use the same abstractions, especially in the same, the same libraries that you're used to in both places. I, I'm quite a fan of that approach. So, um, Browserify is, is, is one piece of the token. Uh, another piece that I, I definitely want to mention, um, this is Douglas McIlroy. In 1964, he, was, he, he had this crazy idea, I don't know where he got it from, that we should be able to, um, uh, like I was talking about earlier, about piping pieces into another, like treating programs like fixtures, uh, like a garden hose. And so he says, we should have some ways of connecting programs like garden hose. Screw in another segment and it becomes, oh, <laughs> when it becomes necessary to, to massage data in another way. So this is the idea of, of taking those pieces, like taking, uh, you know, taking grep and, and piping that to sed and piping that to Perl, and piping that to awk and, and making these nice composable pieces because you can, you can like, Invest your effort into just making the little pieces, and you can stitch them all together afterwards. And and you can reuse a lot of your code. You don't have to worry about like maintaining these big things. It, it saves you a lot of time, and it's very fun. Um, Node has this awesome thing called the Stream API, and I actually have um, I've I've written this document called uh, the Stream Handbook. It's a work in progress, but it it goes over uh, how to use these streaming abstractions in Node itself, not necessarily like with, with command line pipes. So this should work in any platform. Um, and, and so it goes over like, um, yeah, using some of the same art. Like, uh, like here, in, here in Node, we actually have a dot pipe. And what's really cool is you can dot pipe to dot pipes, like here. So you can actually have these kinds of uh, chains of pipes, exactly like you might in the shell. But these are modules that you can pull from NPM instead of installing like with a system package manager. And so <laughs> um, 
Right. The, the other main approach, aside from using module systems and uh, like lower level streaming abstractions and things, is just to, to split up your, your programs into tiny pieces that mostly talk to each other just over the network. Because what's really excellent about uh, just linking your components via the network is, first of all, you can't cheat and start introducing all of this incidental complexity like like uh, maybe in a Java application or C++ application, you know, you, you start calling, you start using inheritance and you start, uh, you know, touching protected methods and, and private methods and, and you sort of have to, things get very um, tightly, tightly bound to the implementations. But when you, when you decompose systems and put them on the network, you can't do that because <laughs> there's a network in the way and it doesn't let you do that. So you have to actually, um, externalize your interfaces. And, and I think that, that that tends to lend to much nicer interfaces. And it, it also lets you build out your applications piecewise more, like incrementally. You don't have to build this big thing and like test everything and make sure it all works together before you can actually deploy it. You can sort of have your system and just let it run. And for your, the new pieces that you want to test, you can just spin those up separately. And, and because everything is just over the network, you can just connect directly to the pieces that you need to connect to. And, and I'll show you guys in, here in a second um, how we do that for Browserling. So Browserling is my company. Um, Glenn was introducing it. It's a, a cross-browser testing site. So it's just, um, it's just me and my co-founder. We're two people. Uh, we've, got, we've got revenue now. It's, it's pretty awesome. But it's just two of us. So. You know, we, we don't have a lot of people to be throwing at <laughs> maintaining things, and we have to kind of, I think, be, be more resourceful with, with how we approach problems. And, and this sort of a small program, Unix-style development de like design is, has been really beneficial for us. So here, here I've got a history of um, how we've sort of built this application. Um, so we started with the Brazilian core. That's like just the website. And um, we have uh, encoder servers. These, these take VNC data, and they sort of slice it up into PNG files that we serve up to browsers. So when you use the website, you can just um, you know, click a, a browser and a version, and then you get bounced to a server. And you can just like, view a, a Windows desktop running on Rackspace in your browser. Um, so we need encoder servers for that. Um, Originally, we had just separate Linux instances, and, and up here uh, in this little cloud thing, we've got all of our uh, Windows desktops that are running. So we, we spun all of that up, but you know, okay, we need a database. Um, this, is, this is an initial hacky prototype, so we'll just like bolt SQLite onto it, because that's easy. <laughs> and, and this was kind of the early days of Node at the same time. I think we started with 0.1.90 or 9.3. Uh, and there weren't a whole lot of database modules back then, but uh, my, my co-founder, Pateris, wrote this little SQLite wrapper thing that worked, worked out, oh, okay, but, you know, okay, but then, well, what if a lot of people, so we had a, a freemium model, so what if a lot of people want to use the application at once? What if there just aren't enough servers right now? Um, I actually had this idea, well, why don't we just, like, make them wait in line like you do at a, at a busy restaurant or something? Um, so we actually have a, a queue that's in the interface itself uh, for the free servers especially. So when, when we don't have enough servers, people just back up in this silly animated queue and there are cartoons and it's cute and people seem to really like that too if you, if you make things really fun and playful. Um, they're much more willing to tolerate <laughs> waiting around and, and being distracted. Uh, but, you know, the next thing we had to add was, like, revenue streams. And so originally we started out with PayPal, and, but, but the way we added it was, was really terrible. I don't even know how that worked. But um, we had to just, like, we, we took our main app. It, it was a kind of, it was getting to be a bit sprawling. It was an express app. And we kind of, like, just were bolting on pieces here and there. I mean, we had, we had some separation, right, because these encoders were all separate processes. And the, the software running on the Windows desktops were separate. Separate, but these were kind of all, all sort of getting not fun, getting getting really difficult to maintain and iterate on. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it, the, the other tricky thing about this this kind of application too is like getting getting things from one place to another, right? So say our encoders need to update something in the database, 
So it needs to like work its way through the, the APIs to sort of snake its way through to, to where it needs to go, like the queue or the database. And it, it, it gets a lot of, it gets really knotted inside. Um, so, so one of the early things we did after, I, I really didn't like that. So we started to split things up. Like I took the auth system and I made it a separate service. So instead of going through the main application, we could just go through um, just the network. And so these green, these green bar, um, lines are just the network connections. So we could connect directly from, from our encoders to the auth server. And it was just a server with, with a, a simple API uh, that used Dnode, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. And like we still had some things that were kind of bolted on. It's sort of ugly, but it was, it was getting better. But you know, we have to add features at the same time. Um, so like, I'd, I kind of realized by this point that, that like, hey, having this, ex this external service is much nicer, because this auth service is only like 200 lines of code, um, and it, it, it makes everything much simpler. So instead of bolting on SSH tunnels, as a feature into the main application, we, we just split that out into a, a, an entirely separate process that itself is only like 150 lines of code and it, and it talks to some other external services. But it was like, that was being much nicer. But you know, and, and then later we, um, we switched out PayPal for Stripe. Stripe is a US um, credit card processor and they're trying to go international, but um, Stripe has a really nice API and uh, we spin out we spun out a separate service for handling those kinds of things. And it, and it just was making our application a lot nicer. And later I switched out SQLite, which was our hacky prototype for a CouchDB, which is really great for doing certain kinds of things, like um, just being a really dumb document store and doing like really smart replication, which is really cool. Um, but then, you know, we were trying to experiment with other products too. So like we have yet another product called Testling, which, you know, we spun out as a completely separate service, but it needed to talk to things like CouchDB to, to store, um, to sort of store the bulk information coming out of it. And, you know, we could just make a network connection to that because it's already an external process. But we also needed to talk to SSH channels. But luckily, because we had already spun that out as a separate process, we could just connect to it directly instead of connecting to it in a really weird way, like all the way snaking through to, to the web service and bouncing out again in a way that we weren't going to anticipate. But doing it this way, we, it was much easier to sort of wire the pieces of this new subsystem in. And, and you know, testing itself had some separate processes too, so we had to spin those out. And later, um, like fairly recently, this was last month, um, I split some things out yet again that made it even nicer to, to mess with. Um, the, the queue system is now a separate component and it, it's, it's getting much nicer to work on this code base and it started out kind of a mess. Um, so Node.js is really excellent and I have the t-shirt here. <laughs> I drew this. Um, Node is really great at writing tiny network programs. So that's, that's sort of like what it's just really good at. So you, know, you can create an HTTP server by doing HTTP.createServer. And you can create a new TCP server in much the same way. Um, and one thing that I really love is, is how with the module system and, and the services, you can create these kind of uh, layers of complexity. And it's, so instead of, instead of building like just, so if, if you have to support a new feature, instead of supporting that feature directly, you can sort of support it indirectly by just building another thing that's completely separate from it. But it might use that itself, but it's like you, just, you get layering and it's much easier to like discard mistakes with that approach and it's also much easier to kind of um, just experiment and have fun. So one, one of these um, projects I have is, is called Dnode, and this is an RPC system that lets you just use callbacks however you like. So you pass them as arguments and you call functions on the server, and it really doesn't matter which side defines them. They all get shimmed out. So long as you call everything asynchronously, it just works. So all of our backend services are using Dnode. But the problem we were running into in production with Dnode was that the pieces mm -hmm. 
like um like you know s separate services would uh like sometimes they would crash and so like we'd have to handle reconnects and things like that. And, and at first I started um, implementing like reconnects directly in Dnode, but that turned out to be really tricky. And it, you know, you have to worry about breaking existing code when, when you start doing that sort of thing. So um, the, the first piece that I built is called Upnode and that's just a completely separate project that implements sort of this reliability guarantee on top of Dnode. Um, so the other big, problem when you're building a distributed system like this with lots of little pieces is that it's you have to you have to manage where those little pieces actually are like what ports they're on what hosts they're on and just where they live in your network and so we were just really hand hacking a lot of configuration files and that was getting really ridiculous especially because if on on some cloud providers your IP addresses change and uh, you know systems just will will go away and they'll come back and everything will be different and crazy. So Seaport uh, helps you handle that. And I'll, I'll show you here in just a sec um, a sweet demo I've got prepared using Seaport and some other tools. So um, the, the last thing I'll be showing is Fleet. And that's just uh, uses this Git server called Pushover. Just it works over HTTP and it, you can just like get push to it. And Upnode, which I mentioned, um, and those connected gives you sort of this continuous deployment crazy mad science experiment. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, an, an awesome hacker from New Zealand who stayed at my couch, or stayed at my house for like a month when he was in the US, uh, wrote, wrote a blog post for Nojitsu at this one point about mad science and why mad science is such an awesome way of approaching problems. Like being very playful and experimental and kind of hacking the pieces out just separately and, and kind of getting a good feel for what the solution should actually look like before you actually implement it. Um, but it can go kind of wrong at the same time if you don't know what you're doing. But that's, that's by design, so <laughs> wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, so let's see, here is this example that I have. Oh, So, so the first thing um, I'll do is start the fleet hub. So here, I, this project is a, is a cluster of, of separate projects. So each of these JS files is a web service. So here I'm using some, some modules, uh, Airport and Seaport. Uh, Airport just uses Dnode on top of Seaport. And um, so here's the cool thing. When you, when you create a Seaport connection, you can um, later on define your web service. And uh, instead of you saying what port you are, you get a port from the system. So this is really nice because uh, you have a central hub that knows where all of the pieces, like where all of the services actually are. So when it comes time to connect from another subsystem, like uh, here this uh, say service, well, just, that's not the right one. So this one, oh, actually the web service does have a connection. Yes. So here is a connection. So this is connecting to the say server and instead of instead of having to hard code the port and the host for that, you can actually just um, uh, reference it by name. So here I do uh, air.connect say, and that just lets me connect to this by name. Or what's really cool too, is you can actually put a semver. Um, it's, it's a number like this, or you can have like special syntax for specifying the version. So another, another big problem with these sort of highly decoupled um, process-oriented architectures is that you might be running multiple different versions of software at the same time because you know you have uh, systems that you haven't ported over yet but with with Seaport you can actually control that um, in, a, in a nice way by specifying explicitly what versions of things you want to run at once so if we just run this service so here this fleet hub will actually let me do um, continuous git deployment against it so, uh, so let's see, if I do fleet deploy, it will, should have tested this more. Ignore that message, that's my silly Linux config. Ah, okay, fleet is being silly. Okay, so here it deployed. Um, so, if we look in the repos directory, it actually, um, 
So it actually created this new um, Git directory and it, it put all the code in there. So what's really cool is um, we can do a fleet spawn and uh, run a, a process just locally, or this could be on any system. So here I'll run the web service. I think that that takes arguments. Yes. I don't know why it's being slow. So we spin this up, and, and of course it's very mad science. It's like that pony with the, the tipped over um, Erlenmeyer flasks and such. Ah. Okay, so there's no processes. This is strange. Wow. One sec. Let's do this here. Okay, this might work. Thought I configured, no. Blarg, well anyways, I'll just run this directly. So we won't see that part, but we can see this part. So what's really cool about Seaport is that um, every, everything registers itself automatically. So here we can go into the web service, and it's running on port uh, 7500. So I, sp I spun up one server, and I can do a Seaport show, localhost 7500, and I can see all of the processes that are registered. Whoops, except it's not doing that, of course. Arg, these demos are not working very well. Oh, here we go. Ah, wrong, wrong syntax. Okay, so, so here um, we have one web, web server process. Um, what's really cool is we can connect to that. So it's running on this port, so it, it does its thing. Um, we can actually spin up uh, like a second web server process if we want. And um, we query the Seaport registry, and now there's two entries, which is really cool. Now, they're running on these automatic ports, but I've got this project called uh, Mounty that will automatically handle those. So here is this router program that uses Mounty. And um, it's listening on port 8000, and what's really cool is you can specify different mount points that you want things to be automatically added to. So you don't have to modify your, your, your system you just spin up new you spin up new pieces that just tell the existing system where they should be put. So, so if we run the router, whoops, we're already running it. Ah, that's why. It, okay. So if we curl uh, localhost 8080 though, whoops, 8000, then um, can't see it because it's it's actually load balancing between both of these. So if we put in a, a console.log rec.url or um, res.write a and in this one, so I'll spin that up, that should be a, now this one should be b. So then we can see, whoops, oh, here we go, support 8000. Yes, so it's hard to see because it's on the side of my screen, unfortunately. Move that over, okay. So, we're getting uh, you know, A and B at the, at the first character there, and that's actually uh, like automatically load balancing uh, based on just implicitly how this, this whole architecture works. And so, but I mean, so basically all of these approaches are just designed to sort of eliminate and reduce technical debt. Because it's, it's, it's like the more technical debt you have, the more resources you have to start throwing at solving these, these maintenance problems. And it just hurts you really a lot long term. And so that is all I have to say. And thank you guys for listening. And if we have time, we'll see if. Five minutes. OK. So yeah, we could, we could have questions if you guys want to ask some stuff. Yeah, 
since lots of guys they haven't used the Brazilian, could you please show show us how to use the Brazilian? Oh, Brazilian? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, well, it's difficult because. <laughs> wait. Okay. So it's really easy to use. You just go to this website, and what if it loads? Am I connected? Whoops. Yeah, so first I have to be connected to the internet. That's the hard thing. <laughs> and of course, then I'll get this spammy message again. Oh, wait, here we go. Okay, cool. So to use Brazzling, it's really easy. You just like click a browser, and you type in a URL, and then that's it. once it connects. <laughs> so, so this is actually completely interactive. I can click around on stuff. Um, if you have faster internet, it's much nicer to use. But so, yep, that's it. And you can like do whatever browser stuff you normally do. Yeah, like go to the next one. This is a Yeah, it, it, it's exactly like the real browsers, right? <laughs> wow. Add ons and all, which are really frustrating, but whatever. Any questions? Can you use can I reach Twitter? Yes, you can through this, but like it's much easier to just use a uh, oh, really cool. use an SSH channel. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> what? Okay. Ah, uh, come on, come on. Ah, that help me with the first floor. Who? Raise your hand. Ah, please pass it to the first Ni 那么有没有一种可能就是说每个小的apps可能有不同的组织或者人来维护他们会有不断的升级或者改变那么的话会不会对你因为你用了不同的apps来做一个自己更大的一个东西那么会不会对你造成很大维护上的一个负担 uh, So first question is what is a goal of the growth the browsing? Which problem does it, does it solve? Oh, so yeah. Brazzling lets you test your website to make sure that it works in all of the browsers. And there are a lot of browsers. And they all work a little bit different. So it's to, to verify that your, your website works. Uh, the second question is, uh, Brazzling is built with, you know, uh, just according to the Unix philosophy, right? And a, a composed by separate apps. So how to maintain this uh, small piece of apps and uh, when the version of the apps in, in incremental, mm -hmm. does it cost too much to maintain this app, small apps, right? Um, so I think that, that having tiny pieces can be really beneficial for maintainability because you, you only have to know about that one piece at a time. You don't really have to know about the other pieces that, that might be directly connected because you have a network boundary. So, and, and you can also um, like ha just let your old system just continue to run and just like build a new version of it and sort of just uh, switch over pieces one by one to the new system. And you might leave the old system just running because you haven't gotten to everything yet. So I think that that, that can be a lot nicer for, for long-term maintainability because it allows you to, to make more incremental progress. 
so you don't have to have long release cycles. You can do things continuously. Can you answer? Ah, our last question. Hi, James. It's really cool too. Like you bring the philosophy of Unix to the network. But the one thing I was considering was that in Unix, that you have pipeline, that you have the a uh, standard interface to stand in, stand out, and uh, it also helps uh, the uh, different people to cooperate on uh, each different small pieces of the whole program. And uh, for, for this part, have you thinking about the, like the common interface to communicate between the different components of the uh, different network APP? Um, so you're asking about standard interfaces? Okay, but like uh, between in the in the same process or in separate processes? Oh, separate. So uh, yeah, I don't think it matters too much. Um, so long as you're using mostly a text-based protocol like HTTP, or I've got Dnode is it's JSON-based. Um, I mean, so long as the pieces can talk to each other, and so long as it's easy to write systems that can talk directly to those, and so long as you avoid things like SOAP and XML RPC, then then you'll be fine. I think. Hello. Yeah, the thing is that uh, if, if you are writing uh, for personal, if you are maintaining your personal program, that you can you, you know how you can design the interface between different components of your own program. But if you want to the other people to collaborate on the same program, then you maybe there was a uh, oh yeah yeah. It's so just, it's just like you know you say stand things stand out stand error, so it makes uh, different different people could focus on their own own app, but it was uh, won't be a problem to talk with each other's application, but for, for this part, I know it's just starting, so have yeah. you ever thought about this, uh, this part of the issue? Yeah, so like for external interfaces, HTTP is great for that. Uh, like everybody knows how it works. You just make a simple API with puts and posts and gets, and, and, it, and it works, and people know how to use that. For internal stuff, you, you kind of have more freedom to, to decide, and you can use like a bit higher level abstractions if you want, I think that works pretty well. Okay. Okay, thanks, James. Yep. Thanks.